Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We are in a series called I Have Doubts. I Have Some Doubts. And we started off two weeks ago talking about the biggest doubter in the Bible. His name is Believing Thomas. That's correct, Believing Thomas. I mean, could you imagine getting a nickname by one mistake that you made in your life? Like your worst, darkest mistake, and everybody calls you by that for the rest of your life? Could you imagine that? Like, honestly, that would suck. That would really be horrible. So Believing Thomas, right, he, he's actually accredited to going down into North Africa and, and, and like establishing the Christian church and creating a movement that spread the gospel in all of that region in Asia Minor. Thomas, the doubter, right? Maybe he's more faith-filled than some of the other ones. And then last week, Pastor Josh jumped like all the way to the other side and he started talking about faith and hard work. So today I wanna kinda land somewhere in the middle I want to talk about doubts and how God responds to our doubts. I was raised with a saying, if you doubt, you're out. And the more and more I've been studying the word of God and scripture and the character of Jesus, I've kind of changed that statement a little bit. If you doubt, it's time to find out. Right? If you doubt, it's time to find out. It's time to get into some scripture and know the character and personality of God. Where did this idea come from? Matthew 28, 16 is kind of the scripture for this series. It says, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. When they saw Jesus, they saw the risen Savior, they worshiped him, but some doubted. So Jesus has risen, they see him in front of them, and yet some still had doubts. Is it okay for us to have doubts in God today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time as we get into your word. I pray that you open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, show us things to come in Jesus' name, amen. So has there ever been a time in your life where you doubted God or had a problem with faith. I propose today that even in the midst of doubt, God can work a miracle. That, that's, that's kind of my pitch today, that even in the middle of doubt, God can work a miracle, that God is not moved by your emotional security. God is not moved by your confusion of the word of God or the circumstances around you. In some of my darkest doubting moments, I have experienced God the most. Isn't that wild? In my deepest, darkest doubting moments, I've actually experienced God the most. And you would think that you didn't experience God the most like on a mountaintop experience where you were like laid out in the Holy Ghost on the floor. No, I mean, that was cool. But when an answer to prayer comes in a deep, dark, doubting moment that that answer couldn't have come any other way except God stepping into your circumstance? No, that becomes more real than anything else. In 1999, yes, in the 1900s, I was attending Rama Bible Training Center. It was like a, a seminary sort of thing and my kids love to remind me that most of my stories are from the 1900s. I was living in Oklahoma. I was in Bible school seminary, learning about the things of God, experiencing the presence of God. I was reading entire books of the Bible a day. I was consuming the word, studying Galatians, studying Ephesians, studying Philippians, writing my own Bible commentary. I had never been closer to God than in those moments of my life, and I was going after it, and I was excited for it. Well, during winter break, I came home for Christmas, and it was snowing outside. A friend of mine was over, and we decided to take my quad out, four-wheeler, four uh, like a dirt bike with four wheels, and we're going to go rip through the trails and have some fun in the snow. Well, as we're walking out the door, my mom says what all moms say, 
put your helmet on. And guess what I didn't do? I didn't know how to put my helmet on. It's snowing out. And if you know anything about being outside in the cold and you're breathing, you're going to fog your shield up. So, like, I tried to put it on for, like, two minutes or so. I was like, dude, I got to get rid of this helmet. So I got rid of the helmet, and I was trying to climb up a hill uh, on the quad. So I had my, my weight forward, and, I'm kind of, and I lose traction. All of a sudden, the quad starts coming back, and it flips back on me, and it lands on my face, and I tumble. I hit my head in a rock wall and a tree. Anyway, I don't remember any of it. I don't remember the situation. I don't remember the day. Uh, my buddy drug his story. He drug me all the way home, a trail of blood from like a quarter mile from where it happened back to my house. And it, it took my parents, we lived in Bloomingburg at the time, it took my mom like two hours to get from the house in Bloomingburg to um, Horton Hospital in downtown Middletown because the snowstorm was so bad. I don't remember the day. I remember waking up in a CAT scan. That's, that's my first memory of the whole day. And I was in so much pain, my face was all swollen, the back of my head was swollen. I had to get stitches all over the place on my head. That accident, being a neurological accident, caused an eating disorder in my body. So something in my brain affected my body's ability to process and digest food. I couldn't eat. Every single day, I would throw up. Every, time, every morning I woke up, I would throw up. Uh, for no reason. And, and there were mornings where I literally was like, God, I really don't want to wake up tomorrow. Because the only time that I had peace in my body and I wasn't sick was when I was sleeping. Waking up just to vomit and, and, and I was vomiting so much that it created a high needle hernia in my esophagus and I was going to have to go get esophageal surgery and all this kind of stuff. Like if you don't get this fixed, it can lead to esophageal cancer and all this fear and all this doubt. And, I, and I, it was just like compiling upon me. My mom had to fly in to Oklahoma. She stayed with me for 30 days because I was dying. I was dying. So one afternoon, my roommate and, and some of my friends that I was on soccer team with, they're going to have an intervention. Come over to my house. They're going to intervene. And they come in there and they sit me down. And I was about 120 pounds at that point. I'm about 220 now. So can you imagine how skinny I was? I know I look sexy right now, but back then it was just, I was like emaciated, you know. And uh, they sit me down and they kind of circle around and they say, Mike, what kind of unconfessed sin do you have in your life that's allowing the devil to do this to you? Man, I was devastated. I was devastated because I'm like, I'm at my spiritual peak. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I'm in Bible school. I'm devoting my life to God. What do you mean? So in Mike McKelvey true fashion, I had to show them what kind of sin it was, and I cussed them all out so bad. Every single cuss word I could think of, it came flying out. I showed them what was going on in my life. I kicked them out of my apartment. I said, don't ever talk to me again. You Pharisees. <laughs> but when they left, I ran into my room. I pushed my face into my pillow and I began to sob and cry out to God. And it's like, what am I doing so wrong? What am I doing so wrong that I'm allowing the devil to do this to me? Amen. And I felt this voice within my spirit. I didn't hear an audible voice. It wasn't something really like hyper-spiritual. I wish it was. That'd be really cool. But it wasn't. I just had this inward knowing that it wasn't what I was doing wrong. It was, it's what I was doing right. Like I was making it advance. It's like the, the enemy doesn't really care about someone who's living in sin and not doing the right thing. He got you. Like you're, you're doing exactly what he wants. But the one who steps out in faith and is trying something new, it becomes a target for the enemy. But here's what I realized. In those moments, in that, in that year and a half of my life, my pain overrode my faith. I'm going to be honest with you. My physical pain overrode my faith. I wanted to die. 
my circumstances halted my spiritual growth. Seriously, it did. Because I was like, God, if you can heal me, why are you choosing not to? That's a real question. That's a real question. And so the Word of Faith style church that I was in back then, you ask a question like that, you're not a Christian. You're not saved. How could you possibly question God in something like that? But that was a real question. And all I was looking for was someone who could lead me towards an answer. But a lot of people don't. They don't want to touch it. I'm not going to touch that topic. I'm going to touch that answer. I'm going to touch that question. And so if I could help one person today who's standing on the edge of doubt or entertaining thoughts of walking away from the Christian faith, if I could help you today, then I've accomplished my goal. I wanna talk about a story in the Bible that has a similar context. No, this person was not in pain, they were not sick, but they were overcome by fear and were influenced by the circumstances around them. This person had the opportunity to be part of one of the greatest miracles in the Bible, He's one of the only other people besides Jesus that are involved in this miracle, and yet in the middle of the miracle, he doubted. In the middle of the miracle, he doubted. And I wonder how many times we are in the middle of a miracle, we don't realize we are, and we doubt. Check this out. It's the story of Peter walking on the water. Matthew 14, 22. Immediately, say immediately. All right, we're going to use that word again. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on to ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. So let me give you the context because this is Matthew 14. In the beginning of Matthew 14, uh, verses 1, it talks about Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist has just been killed. He's just been martyred. He's been beheaded. And the news of that has gotten to Jesus. He's just found out that his cousin, a a, a friend, family, has just been murdered. But he doesn't have time to stop and process this because the story right after that, the story right before this one, Jesus feeds 5,000 men plus women and children. He, He just keeps doing ministry. He's told about his cousin, bam, he just goes and feeds 5,000, plus women and children. Immediately after that, immediately after feeding the 5,000, he's like, guys, I need some time. I need to process this. I need to go pray. I need to get myself right. I need to get my head right. It goes on to say this, later that night, he was there alone. So we don't know how long he prayed, but it was long enough that it's later that night. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Now, man, I have studied this thing through and through, up and down, back and forth, trying to find the deep theological meanings behind the lesson that we're supposed to learn from Jesus walking on the water. And here's the lesson that I learned. It's easier to walk on water than row a boat. If you could walk on water, it would be easier for you to walk on the water than to row the boat. So why did Jesus walk on the water? Because he missed the boat. The boat was already gone. So he walks down there. Oh, yeah, I did send them across. Uh, I already did Pilates this week. I did CrossFit last week, Jiu-Jitsu two days before. I'm just going to walk on the water. And so he goes, he just goes walking out. Pastor Mike, you're being a heretic. You're, you're, you're defiling scripture. No, I'm not. I think Jesus was fun. I think he was fun. I think he was lighthearted. I think they laughed a lot. He goes walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost! And cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately, second time, immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, 
don't be afraid. So like, okay, part of me thinks like Jesus was walking on the water and he's got like a robe on and the wind is blowing so the robe's kind of like flapping. And so I think at one point he's probably like, <laughs> And like, oh, and so then he realized, like, oh, shoot, like, these guys are legit in fear. Guys, chill out. Chill, it's just me. Take courage. Man up. <laughs> Man up. It's I. Take courage. Here's what I want you to know about this. If you're taking notes, write this down. Jesus wants to calm your fears and doubts even before he calms the storm. Jesus wants to calm your fears and doubts even before he calms the storm. Jesus wants to calm your fears and doubts even before he calms your storm. The storm is still happening. The wind and waves is still occurring. And he says, guys, chill out. Take courage. Peace be with you. Relax. Nothing can happen to you now. I'm right here. There can be times that you're in the middle of a storm a problem or a doubt. And even if Jesus doesn't calm your situation, he wants to bring calm to you. Man, you gotta get that one. Even if God doesn't calm the situation, he wants to bring calm to you. Then Peter, big mouth Peter, Peter always gotta say something. He's always got to put him in the, himself in the middle of the situation. He says, Lord, if it's you, what is that? Doubt. If it's you, I'm not saying it is. I'm not so convinced this is you. But if it is you, tell me to come out on the water. And Jesus says, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat. What's that? Faith. Okay, so we've got doubt. Is that you? It is me. Come on. And then he steps into faith. He takes a step of faith. He takes an action of faith. He walked out on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Okay, if it's you, then I walk on water. Doubt, faith. I look at the wind and the waves. Doubt, Lord, save me, faith. Bro, this is a storm of doubt and faith. These are waves of emotions, waves of doubt and faith colliding all together. And I'm telling you, when you find yourself in a crisis, it's the same thing. Amen. It's the same thing. I believe the word of God and what it says, and then you get a bad doctor's report. And then the report is reversed. Oh, we can't find any trace of it. Oh my God, I'm healed. Oh wait, it's back. Like what in the world is going on here? This is what Peter's living right now. He cries out, Lord, save me. And this is what I love, are you ready? Immediately, say it again. For the third time, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Then he says, and now we're gonna look at this. You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Dude, now everybody has faith. Everybody has faith watching what happened with the, with the crisis of Peter on the water. So sometimes people... Look at someone like Peter and it's like, oh, look at him. He had no faith. What's wrong with him? I mean, if I was out walking on the water with Jesus, I would have so much faith. Dude, we don't have, we barely have faith today at all. Barely have any faith today at all. The news tells us it's flu season. We panic. I'm just, I'm just saying. We, we just bombard Peter, and we fail to realize he's the only guy that got out of the boat. He's the only guy that got out. I'm telling you straight out, even if I drown, if I saw my boy walking on water with Jesus, I'm like, soup, pa, da 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 I'm going to try it. 
I'm going to try it too. So we can give Peter some love today. In the same way he had faith to follow Jesus, we also watch him struggle with his faith. He had faith to get out of the boat. But then the cold reality of the water begins to sting his feet. The waves of uncertainty began to slap against his legs. His senses, the senses in his mind begin to override that faith. Because sometimes as Christians, the reality of physical pain overrides your spiritual faith. That's not what God wants, but that's the reality of life. It happens sometimes. Sometimes we struggle in our faith. Scripture says that he's walking on the water when he see, feels the wind, he sees the waves, and he's afraid, and he begins to sink, and he cries out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said, you have little faith. So I love this question. I love this question. Jesus says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Now let's take that literal for a second. When situations happen in your life, why do you doubt? Mm. Why do you doubt? And the truth of the matter is sometimes we doubt that God is a good God. Sometimes we doubt that God is a good father because maybe our earthly fathers weren't so good. Maybe there were times that our earthly fathers weren't there for us when we needed them. Maybe our earthly fathers didn't show up to the soccer game when we wanted them to. Maybe our earthly father walked out on the marriage and, and didn't raise you the same way. And then you had a stepdad and stepdad wasn't a good father either. And so how could this heavenly father be a good father and he's just going to leave me like my physical fathers did, my earthly fathers did. See, so like the question's kind of deep. Why? Did you doubt? What was it about this situation that caused you to doubt? We can take courage today knowing that someone like Peter had an issue with his faith in the middle of a miracle. Some times in the church world, and especially how I kind of was raised in like the word of faith, it wasn't safe to ask questions about faith. It wasn't safe to ask questions about doubts. Because the moment you did that, you weren't a real Christian. You didn't have faith. You didn't love God. And so today I want to take a, a turn here, and I want to talk to two groups of people in this room. The first group of people are those who are right now in the middle of like a faith conflict. There's some doubts that you have about your faith, about Christianity, about how you serve God and how you worship. And I'm going to be honest with you. Since I've been back in college taking theology, I've had more questions now than I ever have about my faith. Theology, taking theology has totally jacked up my head. Like, the whole point of theology is that they don't even give you the answer. It's just like, well, let's just see what 25 different people think about the Bible. And I'm like, okay, well, then which one's right? Well, that's up for you to decide. No! It's like jack my brain up a little bit, thinking about all these different perspectives of theology. And, and you know what? That's okay. But I got to come back to who is Jesus? So there's those people who are struggling with faith. Then there's this other group of people who I hope this is you. That you're in a place right now that you are so healthy in your faith that you can help those who need some leadership out of doubt. That you can be a support and an aid and an assistance to someone else who is struggling in their faith right now. Because I want to remind you that doubts don't disqualify your faith. Just because you're doubting now doesn't mean that you're not a believer and that you're not a Christian. 
It just means that you need some real answers to some real questions. My hope is that real faith pushes through the doubts to an even deeper faith. Real faith pushes through the doubts to get to an even deeper faith. The problem with the church world today is when someone has doubts, those who believe they have arrived or are mature Christians begin to judge them because they're not as spiritual as they are. How could you dare have a question like that? You must not be a Christian. You must be in sin, right, like my roommates. What kind of sin do you have in your life that's allowing the devil to do this to you? Now, I'm just going to ask this. Instead of having that kind of stupid, negative, hateful, judgmental attitude, how about we show the love and grace of God and help those who are struggling in their faith? Because I promise you this, you may have conquered certain areas of your life, but there might be another area of your life that you struggle in faith, right? Like you may have a handle of faith when it comes to your finances, but you don't have the faith when it comes to healing. Or maybe you have faith when it comes to healing and you've seen miracles in your life, but you don't have faith when it comes to finances or when it comes to relationships or whatever else. And you're gonna need somebody to come alongside you and help support you through those sticky points of doubt. So to both groups of people, those who are struggling or those who want to help someone who is struggling, I want to remind you that your doubt is not the enemy of faith. So what is doubt? Here's what I propose today. That doubt is often an invitation to deeper faith. Doubt is often an invitation to deeper faith. Because if you doubt, it's time to find out. And how do I find out? By getting into scripture and getting to know the character and nature of God more. I'm gonna build this case, okay? Because I want you to hear this and I want you to feel this. I don't just want you to mentally assent or understand what I'm saying, but I want you to feel this today. Just because you doubt doesn't mean you're losing faith. Doubt can be an invitation to find out and to grow into a deeper relationship with God. So, Jesus asks Peter this question, why do you doubt? Why do you doubt? And so, if you're in the room or watching online and you have occasions to have spiritual doubts, what's the cause? Why do you doubt? And so I want to take a few minutes to talk about this very tiny point of scripture. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Because I don't know that I was ever taught this, but like the picture in my mind is that Jesus is angry. You of little faith, why did you doubt? Why? Because everybody gets pissed off when someone doubts them. You doubting me? You doubting me? You don't think I can do it? Oh, come on. Remember when you were a kid and you're riding your BMX bike and someone's like, you can't jump over the, you know, the garbage can. Oh, I can't? I can't jump over the garbage can on my BMX? Because <laughs> no one likes to be doubted. And so we say, Jesus must, must be just like me, and he's ticked off. Why did you doubt? You of little faith, why are you doubting me? And many see it as an accusation, but wonder if it's an invitation. Wonder if this is not an accusation, but an invitation. Because the longer I've been a Christian, the longer I study the word, the more I understand the character of Jesus, hear me, Jesus is always loving. Jesus is always loving. He's always loving. Jesus is always full of grace. 
He is always full of compassion. And I think that I was reading this the wrong way. I was reading this scripture accusatory. You have little faith. Why did you doubt me? What if this question isn't an accusation, but an invitation? What if it's not something that is condemning Peter, but it's something that is encouraging him? Instead of it being like, hey, why did you doubt? Because uh, if Jesus was using it accusatory, would he be like, why'd you doubt? Now sink. Tread, son, tread. Should have been trusting me. What's up? What's up? What's up? You made your bed, got to lay in it. Got to live with your consequences, Peter. Took your eyes off me. If it was accusatory, he would have tacked on more discipline and consequence. But that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says that Jesus responded to him like Jesus always does. Immediately, he reached out his hand and he caught him. Immediately. Someone who is loving reaches their hand out. Someone who's judging turns their back. Hear me. Someone who's loving reaches their hand out. Someone who's judging turns their back. I want to remind you what John 3, 16 and 17 says. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And a lot of times we stop there. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world. But that through him, man might be saved. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the Jesus that reaches his hands into our doubt and pulls us into faith. Think about it for a second. They're now a distance from the boat. They're out in the middle of the water. They gotta walk back. Jesus didn't say, well, Peter, figure out how to get back here. I'm walking on water, you might be swimming, I don't know. Like, no, he picked him up and he put him right back where he is. I think it was an invitation. The devil wants you to think that God will let you sink. The devil wants to give you negative thoughts towards God that those th and let those thoughts run unhindered through your mind. But I'll tell you today, Jesus is reaching his hand out even into your life right now. When Peter was drowning in his doubts, when he was asphyxiating on fear, when he was overcome by the circumstances around him, Jesus reached his hand into the middle of the situation. Jesus came and met him in his doubt. In the middle of the miracle, Peter doubted, and Jesus was right there to rescue him. That's a good God. That's a good God. So Pastor Mike, what do you think was actually happening? I think Jesus was smiling. I don't think he was laughing, but I think he was smiling. He was like, bro, what? What's going on? Why are you sinking? We're on the water together. What's up? Right, I don't think it was the dad angry because the son just broke the windshield of the car playing baseball. And I was like, bro. No one else got out of the boat, it's me and you. Come on, man. Come back up where I'm at. Let's walk together. It was an invitation to know him deeper. He was inviting him to be where he is. And I think the walk from where he sank back to the boat, he's like, Peter, remember the five loaves and two fish. Remember the water turned into wine. Remember the eyes that we've seen open and the deaf ears that we've seen open. It was an invitation to get to know him more and to remind him of his faith. So my idea today is what if from a loving savior, 
him saying, you have little faith, why did you doubt, wasn't an accusation, but an invitation. And so maybe you're in that group of people who is ready to help some other people through some doubt questions. Maybe you're a parent and you have a teenager and they've got some questions right now about Christianity, about, about who in the world God can love and who can go to heaven. Can everybody accept Jesus Christ or only people who change all of their behavior serve Jesus Christ? Come on, I'm just saying. And so when we get these questions, when we get these doubts, when we get questions about Christianity, it's not a time to panic. It's a time to process. And I would say, can we process scripture through the lenses of a loving savior? It's a time to have dialogue. Let those around you who have questions ask the questions. And guess what, you know what a, a complete answer is? I don't know. But give me some time to find out. Because if you doubt and you don't have an answer, I'll help you find out. It's time to say, let's talk through this, let's explore, let's keep pushing into Jesus. The problem is, if we as Christians don't handle the doubt moments well, when someone asks us a question, when someone is hurting, if we don't handle that moment well, then those people may feel like we're judging them and it may push them away from faith, unintentionally. But if someone feels like you're judging them because they have real questions that they can't find the answer to, and you come at it harsh and judgy because you think Jesus was mad at Peter and ah, little faith, you can easily push people away from God. And that's not the hope. The hope is say, hey, let's look at this together because the way I was raised, I don't know if that's what the Bible says. So let me land this today. You are either in a position today where you have some doubts, you're struggling to have great faith, and you need some support to walk through these doubts, or you're in a great place of faith and God is calling you to help someone support their faith. You say, well, I want option three. I just want it to be about me. I don't want to help anybody and I'm all right right now. That's not a position in Christianity. Christianity is not a spectator sport. The Great Commission was to all believers. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to all generations, baptize them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? That wasn't to pastors. That wasn't just to the apostles. That's the Great Commission. It's the Great Commission. You have the answer of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, and it is assumed that you're going to help someone else out in life. So you have one of two things. Either you need some help because you're in some doubt, or you're in a place where you're ready to help others who find themselves in doubt. I hope that it inspires you. And please don't always be the person who needs help. That friend is so draining. Every time you hang out, it's a counseling session. Don't be that guy, right? At some point in your life, you should find some victory. You should find some joy. You should find some strength. Maybe today you're called to start a connect group, so, you know, around a hobby or, some, or a special interest, something that you like to do. And no, you don't have to be a Bible theologian and have every answer, but here's what I know, is that a community of believers doesn't grow in rows, it grows in circles, right? These are rows. You don't really know the person sitting all over here and over here. You don't know them. But when we can get small groups of people in circles around things that we like to do, maybe there's some guys who like to shoot bows, maybe someone likes to jog, maybe someone likes to bike, and you can get five or six people, hey, let's go do a hobby together. I know that when you stop and you take a water break or you're gonna have lunch, questions come up. Doubt questions, relationship questions, kid questions come up. And it's opportunity for conversation, not to doubt God and not to doubt faith, but to build faith and to point back to Jesus, the good news of the gospel. 
If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never had an opportunity to begin that relationship with Jesus, I'd like to offer that to you today. The Bible tells us this, in order to be saved, you must believe in your heart and then confess with your mouth. So salvation begins with a belief inside. I believe Jesus Christ is the Lord of, of my life, that he's my Lord and Savior. But then confession, the Bible says, is made unto salvation. So if you're here today and you've never taken that step to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we would love to invite you to do that with us today. And here at Family Church, we pray a salvation prayer. We pray it out loud so you feel comfortable with us. Would you pray this with me? Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started 